Excellent. So yeah, thank you so much for having me. And um, so I've been thinking about what to talk about and I decided, I, I hear so many tales about um, you know, the trials and tribulations of traders, obviously, and um, the triumph that they also can achieve. And so I wanted to give three case studies that I hope um, all of you can relate to, get some insights and inspiration on how other traders overcame their challenges and so that uh, you can too. You can ask me questions at any time. I um, hate Monday TV, as everybody knows by now. Um, I love interaction that brings out the best in me and also the best in you. What I found is that um, I speak basically into a black monitor. I don't know if I'm hitting the mark with what you guys need. So the more questions you ask me, I'm happy to get off my presentation and respond to your questions um, if that is helpful. So it's about you guys, that you guys get the most of the presentation and not about me just um, reciting my stories, okay? Excellent. So what I see often, especially on Twitter, actually, sorry, I, I there might be people who don't know me, so maybe I should, <laughs> maybe I should actually give a little bit of an insight about me. So my name is uh, Mandy Rafsanjani. I mostly trade the decks. Um, I'm a German living in Australia, and that's why I trade the DAX, not only because I'm German, but also because from the time difference, it's easier for the DAX opens either late afternoon or early evening, like seven o'clock um, here in Australia, whereas the US markets, which I actually prefer to trade, they open up like middle of the night, right? So um, I am a professionally trained um, coach. I chose performance coaching. Um, I'm trained in everything, business, relationships, life. Um, that's just the kind of training that I did, which is really useful because what we found is that often the challenges in trading, and you will see that today in the examples that I give, they actually have nothing to do with the markets. They have to do with the challenges that we encounter outside of trading and that then get projected onto the markets. It's always like that, right? The market is just a static thing. And we project whatever our experiences are onto the market. Um, so for example, I have a friend, he loves playing golf and he always has his uh, um, golf clubs in, you know, in the car, his room has there's golf clubs. So like he, there's always something around golf around him. And so it's not that the golf clubs that they project love back to him. He projects the love onto the golf clubs. And because of that, he feels love when he sees the golf clubs. It's really funny. And um, just, you know, do the same for you. If there's something that you are very passionate about, have a look at um, how you project that love onto this thing that has no emotions, but you still feel love coming back from it. And so it's pretty much the same with the markets. Whatever you experience in the markets is simply a projection. So um, I, I work with traders all across, like hedge fund traders, prop traders, retail traders. Um, to me, it's not about where do you work um, and what kind of trading you do. It's about, can I help you? Because, you know, I can't help everyone. That's what I had le to learn as well, because when I started out, I wanted to rescue and save everyone. But I got over that very quickly because that's not possible. Um, so, you know, I've done heaps of podcasts and so on. Who cares, right? So not really important. But so at least you see what I'm looking like and uh, what I look like and um, what I do. So. So as I said, it's not the emotion that mess up traders, it's whatever triggers the emotion. And I still see on twi Twitter so much, you know, um, we have to be disciplined. Um, yes, we do, but that comes with a caveat. Um, it's the fear that causes the biggest um, drawdowns for traders. It's the fear that causes the biggest um, challenges for traders. But actually, it is not the fear. Yeah, it is whatever triggers that fear that causes um, the self-sabotaging behavior. And that's why it's so hard to self-coach because we can't see ourselves on the back of our eyeballs. 
And that's why I question the validity of books and um, we read the information, we have more insights and more knowledge, but then to apply that knowledge to ourselves, it's, it's incredibly hard because I think it was Einstein who said, we can't solve problems with the same mind that created those problems. We call that in coaching boundary conditions. So if, and I'm not doing pure coaching. I'm doing a lot of mentoring as well because pure coaching is only asking questions. But if someone doesn't have an experience of something or the knowledge of something, then how can they answer their own questions, right? It's, it's it kind of doesn't make sense to me. So I teach a lot as well and, and give insights into the person um, because I, I believe there's so many things we don't know about ourselves that we can see from the outside as coaches and then tell the trader about it. And then they're like, oh my God, I didn't realize. So to give you a very simple example, I was driving this years ago, I think, I don't know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, I was driving with my partner at the time in the car. And he was like, can you keep breathing, please? I'm like, what do you mean, keep breathing? <laughs> and he said, you keep stopping breathing. I'm like, what? I wasn't aware that I stopped breathing. And you know, I was holding my breath a lot, which is obviously very unhealthy. But if you don't have an awareness for something, how are we supposed to deal with it? How are we supposed to fix it, right? So the, um, the, it's really, really important as part of coaching and mentoring that we actually show people their unconscious behavior. I think this is like 90% of coaching because once the trader knows about it, then they can actually go about and do something. So it was the same with my stopping breathing. Once I had the awareness, I went and did something about it, right? So I don't stop breathing and I have a very healthy breathing pattern. Okay, so the statistics are still 75% of traders fail. That's the official statistic. The unofficial statistics, um, I have a lot of friends who are working in brokerages or who own brokerages. The unofficial statistics, it's still 90%. Um, there's a little bit of curve fitting going on, I think, with brokers. <laughs> so, but it doesn't matter, right? It's still the majority of traders fail. And when we look at statistics, so in case you didn't know, most brokerage firms, they actually have their own statistics. They look at what is the main reason why traders um, lose and uh, really, really interesting for me as a performance coach. And it is still the same story. They're not cutting their losses in relation to the winning percentage um, or they're having so many losses in a row that they um, accumulate losses, a big loss. And the many losses in a row is driven by um, going on tilt, over trading and so on. So not following their strategy anymore. And then obviously Martin getting into losing trades is the second biggest reason, meaning they keep adding to losing positions until they blow up, especially with the CFD trading um, where it's so easy to do that. Now, we have to also um, look at this in terms of the um, statistics are the same for everyone, right? Actually, yeah. The statistics are the same for everyone, right? So it's a universal behavioral pattern that all humans have in common the martingaling, the, you know, um, over trading, the not taking losses, and et cetera. But what is what it is driven by is wanting to avoid pain, right? So that it's always the same reason that causes that behavior, in in uh, generally speaking. So you know better, but you still can't stop yourself from doing the self-sabotaging behavior. And to be honest, that screws up a lot of promising trading careers. You know, like with every trader that I work with, we go through and look at um, if you were to remove 
the biggest losing trades or the ones that are not uh, according to your trading methodology, would you be profitable? And I can tell you 99% of traders would be profitable if they would not do stupid things, <laughs> right? So, um, it, but it's still, they know that consciously and still they find it so incredibly hard to, to follow their own rules. Now, what is the pain? That is the question, right? But that's the root cause that we need to look at. And that is different for every trader, right? So the cause of the pain is the root cause of that behavior, that self-sabotaging behavior. And that is different for every trader. And again, this is why uh, reading books and, um, you know, reading books and, and maybe watching webinars without asking questions is not as helpful because how do you apply that to your specific circumstances? And that's why I like case studies because with case studies, we can see ourselves in the trader and we can um, draw parallels and then maybe get an idea on how we can improve our performance. So what are the emotions that um, humans uh, seek to avoid? It's always the same, right? So the, the main emotions are guilt, shame, feeling vulnerable, helpless, um, anger, embarrassment, disappointment, sadness. So these are the same emotions I hear over and over and over again when we dig a little bit deeper what is beyond or behind that self-sabotaging behavior. And what you can see is the emotional pendulum, as I call it. So anything that's on the extremes is going to negatively influence our trading. So for example, some traders are too eager to get into the market uh, because they are like, yeah, finally, great setup. So, you know, it's almost uh, euphoria and optimism and hope. But we want to be even keeled, right? We want to be leveled. That's our goal. So whenever we feel our pendulum is uh, going, you know, to one of the extremes, we need to learn how to get back to even keeled. And for everyone, that might be a different strategy. But at least we can look at, you know, again, at case studies on how individual traders do that. So here's the first case study, conquering impatience. And um, this is a trader that um, you can see he's incredibly well organized. I mean, look at the email, how he prepared. Amazing. So that already gives me a lot of insights into this trader's mindset. Um, again, I love how organized he is. So I can take already insights from that, that he would be as organized with his methodology. And indeed, he has been trading the ES for eight years now. And he has a strategy with an edge. It has been thoroughly tested with performance stats, like everything has been tested. We could go back to um, any questions we would ask, like when are the best performing times, when are the worst performing times, um, the best days, the worst days, the biggest drawdowns, um, smallest drawdown, everything he has. He has also clear entry and exit rules. Now, what I found very interesting is that a lot of traders, when they come to me, they talk about um, letting the profits go back into break even and um, or even back into a loss. And there can be two reasons. So one is they have a real strict exit strategy, but they don't follow it. And the other reason could be that they um, have no clear exit strategy. And so the question that I like to ask is, how do you know when to get off the train or when to get off a bus, right? It's the moment when the doors open and everybody needs to have an exit strategy that is that clear. It can be a trading stop strategy. So that's what I found really interesting. My bigger traders, so I have a few traders um, who make millions of dollars who want to reach the next level. And um, all of them actually have a trailing um, volatility trailing stop loss. None of them has a percentage trailing stop loss, which I found really interesting. 
And um, but it doesn't mean anything, right? It doesn't mean that having a half a percent or one percent hardcore stop loss is 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 a bad thing, right? It doesn't mean that at all. Just that's something that I noticed in the big traders. It might be because of the way they have been trained. Um, doesn't really matter. It's just something to to keep in mind because we always want to look at what we can learn from these traders. So um, this guy has a clear entry exit rule. He does everything right. He uses his live market replay to practice his trades that he didn't do well. And um, so it's just this one thing. He could not get on top of his impatience, even though he knows better than that. Right. So um, he explains to me how the impatience shows up. It shows up in over leveraging single trades. So he told me that um, he's doing really well. And then let's say he trades with one contract and then whatever devil befalls him, he suddenly puts on five contracts. Just like that, like a massive jump. Even though in his methodology, in his trading, um, in his trading, um, plan, he has a clear way of how to scale up. So his position size is a percentage of his trading account. It doesn't say go from one contract to five contracts, right? <laughs> it says um, one contract is a percentage of my trading account. And if I increase my profits, then I can increase my position sizing, but not happening. So he takes Really, so his best returns are on the 60 and 15 minute time frame. And that's the statistics told him that. He doesn't make that up. We could go back to statistics and really see, yep, that's the case. And yet, when there is no setup on the higher time frames, he goes to the lower time frames, starts taking shitty setups, and then over trades. Right? Who hasn't done that? I mean, guys, I have done everything that he's talking about as well. It's just part of. Growing up as a trader, I think to learn to um, move away from these kind of self-destructive trading behaviors. And it is possible. So you can see he also um, adds to winners before his methodology tells him. So he sees something, um, trade set up, gets to the position, feels like, oh, my position size is too small because this is going to be a big winner. And then guess what happens? Um, the moment he adds to the position, the trade turns around and he ends up in a loss, right? So it, it seems to be this pattern that he knows how to add to the position the moment when it actually has run its course. Then um, doesn't do proper pre-market analysis. And the other one is he's cutting his winners too early, which is not too worrying for me because is. Winning trades, if we take out the subpar behavior, are still bigger than his losing trades. But so he's doing actually really well on that level if he were to stick to his trading rules. So you can see the level of frustration. Now, what is to be considered is he calls all these behaviors impatience. And that is what he projects onto the market about that's his self image. Another trader would call it something else, right? Um, doesn't matter what you call it. Give it your word, give it your emotion, give it your name, and uh, and then work with it. Right? So that's why I say for everyone, it's something different, um, a different experience that we then project onto the markets that cause them that behavior. So what the problem was, we looked at, he has lost all self-respect. So every time he would do something stupid, um, according to you know the what, what, what he listed, he would lose a piece of his self-respect because he knew that he can do better and he knew that he knows better and he felt like he can't control himself and that would really mess with him. His family started to doubt him and um, his mom told him to get a real job. Now I have to add, he has a very, um, a mom that is getting very involved in his life 
even though he doesn't want her to be involved, but she is like the mother-in-law that you don't want. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's hard, you know, because he has to deal not only with his own insecurities and fears, but also with the fears and insecurities of his mother. Thank God his wife is very supportive of him. She still believes in him, but mothers have this uncanny um, way of messing with our mindset as traders. So he has said, lost all self-respect. Every time he messes a trade up, a piece of his self-respect is, is um, going, being lost and he doesn't know how to get it back. As a result, he starts to feel isolated because he doesn't want to be around other people because he feels so bad about himself. And he doesn't really have friends who understand what he's going through because he doesn't have any trading friends. And um, no one who has ever uh, not experienced trading doesn't know what it feels like to have a bad day trading or to, um, to have messed up the account. Like people don't understand it. They don't get it. So we really need people around us who understand what we are going through. And um and that's partly, you know, what we coaches also do. We, I, I have one trader. I actually don't do much talking. Um, he does all the talking. He just needs a sounding board. He just needs someone who gets him, who doesn't judge him, and who doesn't try to rescue him as well. And he's a very interesting case because whilst he talks to me, he resolves his own problems. <laughs> That's just phenomenal. Uh, needless to say, he's one of the big traders, right? He, who makes every million a year. So, um, um, yeah, very interesting to work with him. I ask him questions from time to time, but that's pretty much it. That's all. And he told me from the beginning, that's all he wants from me. So, uh, yeah, again, everyone is so different. Now, the other thing is that um, this trader feels really guilty, uh, felt really guilty when he lost a big chunk of money. And he thought, oh, I could spend that on my two little girls and, um, you know, um, the, you know, could have taken my wife on a holiday. So he felt like that money lost was spent better in a different situation. So, you know, taking care of his family, for example. And he started um, kind of messing with the boundaries of work and family. It's really important that we keep a clear separation between that is work. And so I said to him, if you had a business selling um, fruit and then you get a whole lot of fruit that hasn't been sold and you have to throw it, you wouldn't feel bad about it, right? You would think it's just cost of running a fruit shop. And you said, yes. I said, why is that different to trading? And I can tell you guys, it is different for us traders because there's so much stigma associated with trading. I'm sure each and every one of you has heard the story of um, you tell someone that you're trading, you're maybe still excited because at the beginning and then people are like, oh, but that's gambling. Or oh, I could never do that. Or oh, that's so risky. Or they tell you stories from a friend they knew was trading, you lost everything, right? So um, that's so much stigma associated with trading. And um, that's why I think it's also another reason why we feel more guilty in trading than in other areas. So with this trader, I lost my one slide. <laughs> Where is it? Um, never mind. I think I, instead of deleting when I did. Okay, so what we did with him, we first needed to create a way for him to find his self-respect again. And that was on several levels. Because he has been trying so hard to succeed in trading, he actually, that's what all he did, right? So he was taking care of his... Um, family in terms of you know spending time with his wife and his uh, girls but that was it like he used to do a lot of sports he stopped doing that he used to have a circle of friends he stopped doing that so where do you get your self-respect from 
you know, it needs to come from other areas as well. And so we started looking at recreating, really building a healthy life and not a life that's just behind the screens. And it's this really vicious circle uh, where, and, and I also heard that from people who were overweight. Uh, let's use the overweight example where they would say, once I lose weight, then I will go out and meet new people and enjoy myself and so on. But that never happens because it's actually the other way around. It's when you start go once you start going out, you become more active and you meet other needs like the need for connection, the, the need for growth and so on. Um, that's when you can start losing weight because you stop eating, uh, you stop replacing um, everything that's lacking in life with food. So everything that's lacking in life is actually then going to be filled up with the very thing that's been lacking, like the lack of connection, like the lack of adventure, uh, the like, like the lack of um, um, acknowledgement and validation and self-respect and so on. Now, so that's the same thing with trading. If you're just hanging behind the screens, you will never make it because the needs, the mass low needs, the human needs are not being met. Um, with his family, when they started to doubt him and his mom said, you know, get a real job and he felt his family didn't respect him anymore. It was more the immediate family than uh, wife family, as I said. But what that was, you know, we, we, we did some work around this and actually what he did was he projected his lack his own lack of self-respect onto his mom and, and other people. So all they did, they were just like a mirror to him. And they could have said anything. They could have said um, the bananas are ripe and he would have seen it as an expression of lack of respect for him. That's in such a bad state he was. Now, so whenever you feel that people say something about you and you feel bad about it, have a look at where secretly do you believe that? And when his mom said maybe he should get a real job, that was just an expression of him doubting if he can ever make it as a trader. Yeah. So uh, um, again, when you have people who say these uncomfortable things to you, be grateful and say, wow, okay, so maybe there is some truth in it. Let me check. It doesn't have to be, but really check in with yourself and see if there's something that you can transform or take on board um, and change so that you can change your trading experience as well. Now, him starting to feel isolated, or if it wasn't that he started to feel isolated, he was actually isolated. And he needed to create a new circle of friends, not the old ones, the new ones, people who didn't know him from his past um, business ventures, where he was actually very, very successful in. So, you know, looking at going to a gym, um, you know, meet, going to meetup groups, etc. That's what we started to implement for him. And then with a feeling guilty, again, looking at this is a business. And when you lose money in a business, that's just normal. And really disconnecting the guilt for running a business from what he would do taking care of his family. Um, what else? I think there was one more piece. So, ah, oh, that's right. So, then we looked at what was driving that experience of impatience. And the impatience really came from he was so fed up having to listen to his mom's comments about him. He was so fed up of feeling like a failure. He was so fed up of living a restricted life because he didn't have enough money or, you know, he was, he still had you know, enough savings, but he was really careful with his money um, and not living life to the fullest and not, you know, um, giving the experience to his family of living life to the fullest. And also his wife working full time in a very good job, but that didn't, that wasn't the point, right? So he wanted to be the breadwinner again. 
and he felt a little bit emasculated because she made more money than him. All of this was driving the impatience, the, oh, I so want to make it happen. I had enough. And then he was trying to force things out of this wanting to escape the feelings that he had felt. So I said to him, what is it that you really want to escape? And he said, I just want to escape feeling bad. And I said to him, okay, so when you push in terms of, you know, doubling up your positions or driving two big positions, how does it make you feel better? And he said, well, in the moment, it makes me feel better because I think there is a great opportunity. And I said, okay, so how do you end up feeling? He said, well, like shit, really bad. <laughs> and well, his words, not mine, right? Um, even though I do like to swear sometimes, but, you know, because it's just appropriate um, expressing how we really feel. But yeah, that's, you know, he said, I've, I end up feeling even worse. And I said, can you see that the very thing that you're trying to avoid is exactly what you created? And can you see that if you and we did that work, right? We went through all his trades and retraded it according to the system. If you had simply followed your system, you would already derive a six figure, a mid six figure income. And the only reason why you don't do that is because you want to escape feeling bad, because you're looking for self respect in the wrong place. And when he saw that black and white, it was such a profound transformation for him that um, the urge to the impatience just fell away. And so sometimes that's all it takes, just a different perspective and understanding and working through things. And then the monkey loses its power, just, just jumps off the back. Okay, tail number two. Now this kind of trade, this trader, um, also super, super interesting. Um, again, fantastic statistics, has a strategy with an edge, thoroughly tested, uh, clear entry and exit rules, same using live market replay to practice his trades. Um, and what the challenge for him was when the trade doesn't play out the way he envisioned, he would feel rage right it would drive him insane as he said and then on the back of that so the feeling of rage and anger is not the problem but um on the back of that what would happen is he would do stupid things like forcing trades going on tilt um getting in and out in and out in and out until he lost a whole bunch of money not based on his methodology but just out of rage and anger now, so um, this is what he wrote to me. And I, I just love it because, and I said to him, just tell me exactly what you experience, right? So I need to see every word because the words that someone chooses help me really to get inside their mindset. That is, you know, underneath their conscious, um, conscious awareness because I would need to go down into the unconscious of my trader to find out what's really driving. And he said, so here's another example of that a market that absolutely infuriates me. Um, I, so he read the market right, but every fucking time it came back and took me out only to roll over and continue. So it was a sideways pattern. And then finally this thing broke out of the sideways pattern and, and you know, it skyrocketed to his target. So that would have been a massive profit. And you can see like even his email is so angry, it's so full of rage and infuriation. And um, that's exactly what I wanted from him. I wanted to really experience what is what he's going through. Yeah, as you can see that this would destroy all the good work that he would put in. And again, um, we looked at if what his performance would be without the infuriate traits, and he would be massively in profit. He would really live the life that he's wanting to live, right? So what the heck? This is crazy, right? So we know exactly what we want. We know exactly how to get there, and yet we are not doing it. 
Now, I also have to add here, um, obviously, these are all examples of traders who have a methodology that works, that is tested. Um, I also have traders, a lot of traders who contact me, but their methodology is not clean. So let me give you an example. I was working with a trader who um, was massively up, I think, $60,000 in a um, small cap, Australian small cap. Um, or it was even like a penny stock or something. And then this thing turned around and kept going lower and lower and lower. And now he's massively underwater, like you know, hundred thousand dollars underwater. And so in his case, his exit strategy was not clean cut enough. Now there was so much room for, oh, maybe it's going to continue to the upside. Maybe it's just a retracement. Is it a retracement or is it a reversal? Like what is that? And I also saw that a lot in uh, recently in the um, trades. I don't know. Let me see if I can pull up. Yeah, it works. So um, that's Mr. Dex. So I think it was on the Dow. Um, so for example, here that weekly. Yeah, so these, these big bearish candles is what uh, is called a long liquidation flush. Long liquidation flush, long liquidation flush. That means that they just, um, yeah, long liquidation flush. That means they just have a one day flush and then they continue in direction of the um, trend. So, a lot of traders seem to have gotten caught up in these long liquidation flushes and were short thinking it's going to be follow through um, testing this level here. And, and I also thought as well it's going to follow through, but um, thankfully I closed out my position overnight. So I was short that during the day, closed it out overnight. Sorry, other way around. Um, the Asia session came down further. So I closed at the end of Asia. And then when US session started, you can see here's the gap. It, it was already rallying up for the US session. So thank God I didn't get caught in that, but I saw quite a few traders who got caught into that. That was just a lack of skill. And it was something that I had to learn too um, in, previous, in my previous life. I got caught up in long liquidation flashes and then figured out when they work and when they don't work. Yeah, so um, it's not always just mindset. It's often also skill set that's missing. So please be aware of that. Okay, we're going with time. Right, so um, what we did with this trader, right? so I explained to him, um, anger is always a very interesting one to me. I, I just love working with that. So with him, what, hang on, I just need to find my PowerPoint again. Uh, here we go. So when we look at anger, anger is always about boundaries not being respected. So when you look at uh, children whose parents didn't respect their boundaries and try to force their will onto the child, the only way the child knew how to protect itself was through getting angry because children obviously don't have the language and nor do they have the strength to um, keep the big people, the adults away from them, right? So um, it could be something simple like a mother trying to force the child to wear a certain outfit and the child doesn't want to wear that outfit, right? It could be something like that or it could be, you know, obviously more, um, more, um, negatively affecting like um, you know being beaten and so on right so abuse now so the level of the boundary not being respected is not really that important but it's not knowing how to protect that's then when the anger erupts because anger always comes with a feeling of helplessness so I have a certain need as a child my need is not being respected by the caretaker who is bigger and stronger 
than me and has more power than me. I experience helplessness. The only way how to deal with that is to get angry. The other extreme is to withdraw, right? To go into hiding. So that's where we have the hide and flight and fight response that we see in the markets as well. So the hiding would be not taking a loss, right? Um, just avoiding taking um, the measures that need to be taken in order to succeed. And the uh, fighting is, you know, going into going into tilt and over trading. So in his case, um, this trader has a very controlling, critical father. Nothing was ever good enough. And it was really interesting because we also looked into the history of the father and um, it actually made sense why the father was like that, but it still doesn't justify and it didn't help either. <laughs> so what was going on was then this trader had a lot of negative self-talk and guess how his negative self-talk was exactly like his father's um, talk, how his father talked to him. So he repeated his father's behavior. You're such an idiot. What's wrong with you? Why do you do that? You will never make it. That's how he talked to himself. And he, it was like when he was in, in a trade, before the infuriation, before the rage triggered, he was, um, it was like he had two voices in him, an angel and a demon. It's like, come on, I can't be strong. I can't be disciplined. I will not give in to that. And then it's like, oh, screw it. And then he would just start doing that behavior that was really not um, helpful. So what was also in his family was that anger was actually not allowed, right? So his father was allowed to get angry, but he was not allowed to get angry. And so when he would respond with anger, he would get punished. He would get put into the room, locked into a room until, you know, until you have calmed down and you show some respect again, young man. And so that's why it's so uncontrollable nowadays, because he has never learned how to regulate anger healthily or how to re regulate any of his emotions healthily. Right. His parents didn't know that, so they couldn't teach him. And so he needs to learn that now. We call it reparenting. He has to learn how to um, become a functional, healthy adult that has all kinds of emotions and can learn to regulate them in a grown-up way. Now, what we also know is that the market is um, acting as an authority figure we experienced growing up. So ask yourself, what is that person... Um, um, that if if the market were one of my authority figures, who would that be? Would it be a father, a mother, a sports coach, um, just someone who was really, really important in your life? Because it's not always the parents that bring us up, right? So would it be a sibling? And then look at how do you feel towards that sibling and you will realize, uh, sorry, how you feel towards that authority figure. And then you will realize that the feelings towards the market are very, very similar. So this is what we found out. So however he felt about the market, this trader, was actually just a reflection to, in terms of how he felt um, about um, towards his father. And so we started untangling all the enmeshment with his father, all the feelings and giving him some clarity of mind so that whenever the market didn't do what he wanted to do, he was able to just say, well, it's just the markets. I, I, it has nothing to do with me, nothing to do with um, helplessness or boundaries. It's just the markets do their thing and I need to learn how to read it. Right? So um, that was really what it was about for this trader to understand where the anger came from and to then being able to separate trading and his family history and also learning how to um, um, healthily express, express his emotions, right? So express the whole spectrum of emotions and not to repeat his childhood. So this is what Carl Jung calls the compulsion to repeat. The compulsion to repeat means that as children, we have learned what to expect from the world. We have learned how to expect to be treated. So if you have a child um, who 
typically whose parents separated. And nowadays, um, people deal with that more constructively because there's so much help, the internet and coaches and counselors and so on. But, you know, in the 70s and 80s, there wasn't any of that. And so children would suffer from the separation. And let's say parents separated and the child experienced the father moving away. And the child would see that through the eyes of abandonment as a grown up, that experience of abandonment is then being keep, kept repeated until awareness is being brought to it and that wound, that childhood wound is being resolved. But that's the compulsion to repeat if you uh, want to Google it. And that is what we see a lot in the markets, right? A lot in trading. So um, you can see that when, it's not always like that, but when the traders go through emotional upheaval and they don't know how to resolve it. It's always something deeper that we can look at and that um, can be resolved. So what is also really important is to look at something that is called um, the attachment theory. So as a child, we learn how to relate to the people that we need for survival attachment and that depends on how they treated us so if you have someone who's hot or cold when you're a baby and um, maybe doesn't give you enough attention then um, there would be you know that that creates the um, what we call the needy people right who are like begging for love that also shows up in trading it's really super interesting um, but yeah so attachment theory it's also something that can be looked up looked at if you want to um, if you want to google it so you can see with this trader there was a lot of um, avenues that we could go down and look at how to help him to really get the experience of being angry and infuriation to just release that so it doesn't show up anymore now if we try to control our emotions this is almost impossible i always say the emotions are like beach balls that we try to press under water and then they um, pop up just in the worst moment right into our face that's so how instead of uh, instead of needing to control emotions look at what is it why do i feel this way have i ever felt this way in other areas of my life as well and then um looking at where how does it play out in my trading and how can I have healthier behavior and control that? So uh, and control my behavior through looking at um, better coping strategies. That's what I meant to say. Um, trader number three, how to survive a losing streak. Again, same thing, systematic trader, clear entry exit rules, thoroughly knows um, his um, numbers, the statistics of his trades. What happened with him? He was doing really well, and then he had a massive drawdown because there was a gap, an overnight gap, and that that was like half his account. Um, if his position sizing was perfect, his um, um, trade entry was perfect, but you know it was one of those unexpected things. And that really hit him. What we need to remember is that big losses, these significant losses, they can be very traumatic. And I saw an interview with Lance, um, I forgot his name, um, from SMB or used to be SMB. And if anyone knows, can put it into the chat, please, so I can remember the name. Um, but so he also spoke about how trading, how he had a really big loss and how traumatic it was and how he actually worked through it with his trader. I see there's a hand up. Um, CD mail, there is, your hand is up. So if you have a question, just uh, type it into the box, please. Um, so yeah, so he also talked about how traumatic losses can be and traders underestimate that. Right? We think that when we have a big loss, we just have to be tough and get through and show grit and persistence. 
but man, you know, have some compassion for yourself because it is really unsettling to have a big loss like that. And so what happens then when we have a big loss and we are usually doing well, the mindset shifts from wanting to trade well, wanting to make profits, running a business to wanting to recover the loss at all costs, wanting to get back to um, the old performance, to the old high water level. And that's then when all the mess starts. That's then when we start losing our confidence in ourselves. And what also happened was he had a fear of not being able to feed his family. Um, he was afraid of disappointing his kids, of letting his family down. So he's a family man. And that was really at the forefront of his fears. Really interesting. It's like, what if my strategy is not working anymore? So there was so much self-doubt coming up suddenly. And he didn't have a mental and emotional recovery routine after that loss to get back to even keel. Right? So that was really missing for him. Now, if you want to get back to optimal performance, make sure you have a mental and emotional recovery routine on hand. When you look at tennis players, and that was by uh, Jim Lure, he created that, I think, in the 80s with you know the Agassiz, maybe in the 90s, I can't remember, but you know um, Agassi and all these kind of um, tennis players at that time, he looked at how is it that successful tennis player can, players can deal with setbacks so well where do they get their strong mindset from? And he noticed that all of them have a certain way of how they talk to themselves, what they do, um, how they walk, where they walk to after having lost the set. And he collected all these pieces of information and then created a recovery routine for his tennis players and taught them how to you know, be strong and um, be able to get back on your horse, so to speak, really, really quickly after a loss. And this is what Linda Rushdie is super strong in. If you have read her book, Trading for Deans, um, where she talks about all the setbacks, all the challenges she had in life, that's her superpower. Right? She is really good at when she had a setback to just buckle down, to focus, and to get back and, and overcome and come out, overcome the setback and the slump and come out like things out of the ashes, even bigger and better, better for it. What is also important is you need to know your stats. Right? So when are the times when you outperform versus underperform? And again, Linda Rushdie, market wizard in, um, in uh, the market wizard books, if you want to read up on her or, or Google her, um, she always says, I only need three good months to have a really amazing trading year. And so she doesn't want to make money every day. And this is what I see with um, retail traders. They want to make money every day. And yeah, maybe some can. I have never seen anyone who could. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's statistically very challenging to do that. So we don't need every day to trade or need every day to um, outperform. We just need to know when are the times when we are doing really well and then push those times, be fully focused and trade the bigger positions then. And so um, that's what we did with um, this trader who had a performance slump. To get his confidence back, we looked at how did he in the past perform during the underperforming times and what was the market like? And how long did it take? And how did he get back into outperforming the market in himself? That gave him confidence again that he didn't need to be afraid, that he didn't need to worry that um, good times will come back again. And indeed, they came, right? So um, uptrending equity curve again like crazy, right? So the other thing is do extraordinary. As traders, every trader tells me they want to be amazing traders. And some even want to be in the top 1% traders. If you want to be in the top 1% of traders, you can't do an ordinary. And ordinary is complaining, bitching, giving up, not doing the work. Right? And I said that to my trader 
who said he doesn't um, plan, he doesn't prepare. I said to him, you, do you want to be an amazing trader? And he says, yes. And I said, well, then you can't do the things that normal, ordinary people do. You need to do the things that the extraordinary people do because that's the very definition of extraordinary. No one wants to prepare and plan, right? We have better things to do, but we do it because it gets us the results. And that really landed with him. So at the core, what all these three examples had in common, that the traders wanted to avoid failing. But in the attempt to avoid, avoid failing, it's exactly what they created. So we need to give the definition of um, failure, the, sorry, the experience of failure a new definition. So a trader says, I had a really big um, um, drawdown. Well, fear of failure. Now I want to avoid failure. Now I start pushing the market and forcing the market and putting on too many trades to recover the losses. That needs to be the definition of failure, not the money that has been lost. The trader who um, was angry, the anger, the definition of failure, because he was the same, right? He wanted to avoid failure because he wanted to prove to his father that he can do it, but he is not a waste of time, that he is not a loser, that he is not a failure, and trying to almost proving his father right with his anger and with his um, behavior that actually led to big losses. That needs to be the definition of failure, the not following your methodology and doing those things that don't help to succeed. And in this trader, right, who was impatient, well, that's the same thing. Over leveraging is the definition of failure. And so if you over leverage and you don't follow your strategy, you have failed. It's not about making the money that is the success. Um, over trading is failure. Adding to winners too early before your system tells you is the failure. Um, cutting winners early is failure. Yeah, so, so whatever it is for you, you know, we had to go, of course, to more detail and saying, just saying it is failure. But um, again, it's so individual for everyone that um, just apply and try to apply it to your circumstances, to your context. So that that is pretty much the core of what I see with traders. Everyone makes those mistakes for two reasons. They want to avoid the pain. They want to escape the pain. And they want to avoid failure. And in the attempt to escape the pain, they create even more pain. In the attempt to escape failure, they um, create even more failure. All they need to do is follow their methodology to avoid the pain and to avoid the failure. And as I always like to say, every successful trader had a dark past. Look at Linda Rushke starting her trading career with a 50,000 US dollar um, loss in her first six months. It was in the 80s, 1982. So there was a lot more money now in, in today's numbers. And then she became one of the best traders in the world. And every losing trader has a bright future. And though no one can go back and make a brand new start, anyone can start from now, from today, and make a brand new end. And if you have any questions, there is no questions in my um, chat, so you're welcome to ask. Mm -hmm. No questions? Obviously not. <laughs> okay, David, save me here. <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, last <laughs> call. Any any more uh, questions? Questions, comments? <laughs> Nothing. Thank you, Brock. Uh, revenge trading. Um, do you have a question about revenge trading? 
can you give me a little bit more detail or more insights? I'm happy to stay and answer your question. I just need a little bit more. So what is your definition of revenge trading? Let's start there. Yeah, so it's the same concept, isn't it? It's about wanting to avoid failing, wanting to get the money back in order to succeed and in order to avoid the pain. Averaging down is the same thing, right? Um, how to stop bad trading habits that you've been doing over and over again. Increase the betting size to recover losses. So you can see that's all the same patterns of behavior. It just plays out differently. So if you go back to the revenge trading, and thank you guys for asking those questions. Um, so if you go back to the revenge trading, you... Yeah, so um, when you trade, when you revenge trade, it's almost like blind, right? So you have the experience of you did something wrong or um, you have the experience of you have to get that money back. Um, otherwise, there will be um, consequences, right? So there's always a consequence attached to the experience of revenge trading and what you need to do in your mind you need to look you need to shift the focus on the consequence what is the consequence um, of revenge trading it's a little hard if i can't interact with you to give you an answer because you know again it's so individual but so what is the consequence of revenge trading if you were to follow, if you had a big drawdown and you just keep following your methodology, can you make that money back? Right? That's what you need to ask yourself. Um, let me just go back here. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you. You have made me think of all the emotions involved in my trading. So the question of porn, how do you stop bad trading habits that you've been doing over and over again? I think that question encompasses all the other questions. Right? That's like a nice, beautiful summary. How do we stop bad habits? So number one, it is becoming aware of the bad habits. So my traders, they sent me charts with um, a text that explains what they did, what their habit was. And so did they, um, you know, like uh, like with the trader that you know I mentioned before, who said um, he felt infuriated. They all sent me charts just to bring that to the conscious awareness of what they have done. It's kind of like having a little puppy dog and puppy dog put in the living room and then you push the nose into the poo, right? I mean, that was what they used to do. I don't know if they have new strategies nowadays um, to train a puppy dog, but that's where it starts. Become really aware because what we naturally do is we don't want to look at it, right? When I have my traders who... Um, I say, show me your statistics. I said, I don't have statistics. Why? Because it's just too painful to look at the statistics. I was like, okay, I really, really get it, but it's not helping. And we have to look at our statistics. The um, So that's step one. Become really aware of your bad habits. Step two is look at what is it that you're trying to avoid so what is it that you are trying to avoid by doing the bad habit? I'll just put that into the chat box. What is it you are trying to avoid? And and so, you know, 
it always comes back to wanting to avoid failure and wanting to avoid bad feelings. But why? What would failing mean about you? And whom do you want to prove wrong? Yeah? So who is doubting you? Who is, um, um, who is the last person that you want to know that you are not doing well? Yeah, that's usually where it starts. Yeah, so what is it that you're trying to avoid by doing the bad habit? And then become very aware how by doing that bad habit, you actually create the very thing that you're avoiding by doing the bad habit, you create the very thing, the very situation you are trying to avoid. It's always like that. So when we have people who, going back to attachment theory, who have insecure attachment, so these are the codependent, the needy people. Why are they needy? Because they're afraid that the person that they want love from so desperately is going to leave them. And then they become overbearing and overpowering and annoying and crossing boundaries and not giving space. And what happens, the person that they don't want to leave them is actually leaving them because they can't deal with it anymore. And what we also see with people who ha uh, have insecure attachment, they give their own identity up. So, you know, they are standing fully in life, amazing people, they meet a partner, partner's like, wow, I love this person. They start going out after a month, that person completely changed, gave up their own identity and became like a doormat. All in the intent not to lose the other person. Exactly the same pattern is in trading. Someone wants to be successful so desperately and so they start doing these unresourceful behaviors and create exactly that what they're trying to avoid, the failing. For me, when I start, uh, when I make a mistake, I start to trade my PL and not my trading plan. That's exactly, it's exactly, it's so common, right? So it's what I said here um, with this trader who was doing so well. And then he had a... Um, big drawdown and suddenly all it all it became about was to make his money back to make that money back and you know people say i want to be a full-time trader yay the reality of being a full-time trader guys it's tough when you can't rely on anyone else anymore to pay you it's scary i had that, that um conversation with my friend heidi um heidster trades it's scary being a full-time trader and just relying on your trading, especially when the markets don't do so well. I most underestimate because I don't think that would ever happen, but it does. Yeah, so when you start trading your P&L, um, it's really so important that you make yourself clear. It's that money that I lost, I can never make back. Like you can never make back time, but you can keep your behavior strong and solid and focus on trading well. And then you will get back to making the income that you need in order to trade. So the PL is just an outcome, right? The PL is not about you being able to pay your bills. Um, and so it's great, Terry, that you already have that self-awareness that you then start trading your PL. It's a very, very common behavior. Um, so natural and all the behaviors that we have, I would say that now um, finishing up, all the behaviors that we have is learned behavior that is also um, very common in our society. I mean, where have we learned to own our mistakes, right? Certainly not in school. <laughs> um, where have we learned to focus on our performance um, and not on our um, outcome? You know, we, we don't learn that. We get judged everywhere for, um, you know, especially on social media for our results. No one, I, I remember um, someone made a comment that um, he called me chubby. And I'm like, you know what? I actually just lost 20 kilos over the last year. So he didn't know where I was coming from. And yes, I might still be chubby, but 
uh, I'm so super proud that I uh, lost that amount of weight. And so the judgment is so quick, right? And that's also what happens in trading very quickly. And we have to be building very strong, resilient mindsets to not get influenced by the outside world. So um, yes, well, thank you so much for all your questions. We went a little over time. Um, David has had a long day. So another two more days coming. Thank you so much for organizing these events, David and Anka. So grateful um, that you guys do that, um, giving us a voice. As I can tell you, it's incredibly hard to run a business. Um, I'm always on top of the latest coaching tools, doing professional development, um, trading the markets, uh, you know, especially the time difference. I trade the deck open and the Dow close at the moment because close at eight in the morning and, and in between as well when there are setups. So busy days, there's not enough time for us to do marketing. And so thank you, David and Anka, to give us a voice and share hopefully a lot of goodness with you guys too. Thank yeah, you, uh, thank, thank you, Mandy. Great presentation to close up the day for us.